campus of Stanford University. People are worried about data. They're worried about their privacy and their security. They should be. We need secure systems. This is the future of everything. But we can't have a system that closes that data off. It is too rich of a source of inspiration, innovation, and discovery for new things in medicine. With your host, Russ Altman. Today on The Future of Everything, the future of cryptography and the government and their rights to uncryptograph things. The internet, source of all knowledge, defines cryptography as the study of writing or solving codes to keep information secret. Now, I don't know if we like that uh, definition at all, but cryptography is clearly critical, especially for internet security. We have financial transactions that we use on our phone, on our computer, even at the bank. We have private messaging, or what we like to think is private messaging, our voicemails, our texts, our videos, um, tweets are not that private. Uh, Facebook is always confusing about privacy because it seems like they change their rules regularly. Um, we have private web browsing and non-private web browsing. Many of us are aware that there's HTTP, but then there's HTTPS. Uh, on many browsers, there's this mode that uh, seems very um, secretive where they promise that they, you won't have cookies. That, well, there are cookies, and I don't mean like Oreos. I mean like these things that track you around the Internet and many other uses of technologies to try to give you some uh, transactional privacy in, uh, and security. Of course, a lot of this is on our phones. Um, I recently went on a trip overseas, and Stanford recommended that I not bring my phone. So I went from a new phone that's nice and fast to an old phone from about two years ago that is slow, uh, three years ago. It's very slow, um, but uh, evidently Stanford was going to wipe it clean when I got home because they were worried about whether this, during my travels, it had been in some way corrupted. Uh, my phone does have – my normal phone has my passwords, my banking information, all my photos. It has my geolocation from where I walk around with the phone. Uh, it's mostly encrypted, uh, and I think, uh, and I have this little silly password that I use to get into it. Um, some of my friends have their face instead of a password. They use their face to get into their phone. Um, you know, there's, this has been in the news. Uh, there was a, a, law, a big case where uh, Apple – squared off against law enforcement to open an iPhone. It was the iPhone of a mass murderer in San Bernardino, clearly kind of a bad guy, and the police wanted to get into that phone. Uh, I don't remember the reasons. I'm sure we'll, we can find that out, but it was something to do that were there uh, accessories to the crime, what, how, what was the premeditation, blah, 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 blah. The police felt that they had a legitimate need to get to this information, and Apple, uh, I, as I understand it, refused to help them break into the phone, and eventually the police figured out another way to do it. Uh, more personally, I, I had a friend whose uh, uh, young, uh, young adult child died somewhat tragically and unexpectedly, and all they had was her phone, the phone of the, of, the, of the young woman who died. And they just wanted to open it up to get the pictures and to get the contacts of her friends. Uh, but no, they couldn't. There was no way to get in that phone. Nobody knew the password. And as far as I know, it was like a brick. They couldn't get anything out of it. So this raises the issue of what's the right thing to do. On the one hand, privacy is important. We are aware of how our data can be used to manipulate us, not just to get us to buy things, which is kind of almost – nothing and easy compared to other worries like are they going to ma manipulate our sentiment for elections, they – people, uh, or are they going to change uh, the uh, direction of social discourse by manipulation? On the other hand, law enforcement does have a job to crack into networks of bad guys, uh, bad people, terrorists, human traffickers, drug dealers, all the really bad people that you can think of and those who facilitate those bad people. And so there is an argument for getting into those phones uh, when, when law enforcement needs to. So there's this tension. What do we do? Well, Rihanna Pfefferkorn, a cryptography fellow at the Center for Internet and Society, studies cryptography and government rights, regulations, and restraint uh, in the context of secure information. Rihanna, you have recently been working on legal arguments relevant to a proposed new law in Australia. Can you tell us what they're proposing to do in Australia and why it's important for you here in the U.S. to be thinking about that situation? 
Sure. So thank you for having me on. I'm really pleased to be able to come on and talk about my work. So uh, the new proposed bill that's just come out in Australia after about a year's worth of work and rumblings about this potentially coming out uh, is meant to address this tension that you identified between law enforcement and technology companies and their users about how our government's supposed to do their job of being able to efficiently resolve criminal cases and prosecute and put bad guys behind bars um, in an age of nearly ubiquitous encryption when now it's very easy for us to encrypt our messages to each other, to encrypt our devices, to encrypt our laptops. And so what that bill would do is to purport to mandate that companies, tech companies, a very widely defined category, uh, ha maintain the capability somehow to give access to law enforcement agencies or security agencies uh, upon due demand or even voluntarily, which is a significant difference from U.S. law, when uh, they have the technical capability to do so. And that might either mean using an existing capability or building something new to provide what we might what's co commonly called exceptional access, usually to devices, but also to messaging apps, potentially a wide range of, of services, pieces of software and, uh, and systems. So, so the Apple situation that I described where they I, – right. I believe Apple said we can't even do it. Right. Uh, I'm not sure if that was true or not. But they would have – they in, in Australia, mm -hmm. if this law passed, they would have to have a way to kind of break into a phone or that's, that seems like a – a loaded way of saying it, but they would have to provide a way to get access to information on any one of their devices. Right. So in the Apple versus FBI case, as it's commonly called, Apple's protest against the order that was originally issued by a court that was later withdrawn um, after, as you mentioned, a, the police use a third party means to get into the phone. Apple's protest there wasn't that they would be unable to do it in terms of rolling back the security features that they had implemented on iPhones. It was that to do so would be to build a tool that was really too dangerous to be built because of the potential for it to fall into the wrong hands or to be abused. Because if it's built for this, what was supposedly just this one phone, just this one time, then it would be called upon to be rolled out again in other instances similarly. And not only by the US government or the Australian government where we have a rule of law, where we're a democracy, it would also be called upon by uh, more oppressive regimes in authoritarian countries uh, that do not have respect for the rule of law and that have a poor human rights track record. And so in addition to that, it would also be a huge target for cyber criminals and hackers and organized crime to try and either hack into Apple, to try and fish one of their employees or otherwise fool them or extort somebody in order to get access to that mechanism for getting into somebody's phone. Since, as you mentioned, we keep so much of our lives on there, including a lot of financial information. The fact that phones are encrypted by default and laptops are encrypted by default by and large now has really cut down on a lot of the incentive for theft because the value isn't necessarily being able to resell this particular hunk of metal. It's in all of that data that you can get to once you have access to somebody's phone in terms of their bank accounts and so forth. You're so right. I recently... Um had the pleasure of writing a will. <laughs> a lot of fun. Thank you but for doing that. But one of the things that I did is I have a little note in there about the password to my phone because basically if I if I give that to my to my descendants and my heirs, they have everything they need to find all of my assets and everything. So right. it really is just that one password is the key thing that they need. So going back to Australia, what are the, tell me why this has caught your attention and your effort. Uh, I, I presume that you think it's a very important precedent that might have global implications? That's right. So Australia is one of what's called the Five Eyes countries, which is an intelligence partnership among Australia, New Zealand, the UK, Canada, and the United States. And they recently released a joint statement after consultation with each other about the need to continue to press companies on encryption and for the ability to do their jobs. Um, and so there is a risk that I see of there being a sort of a domino effect where if we see a law that has a lot of very negative security implications, negative privacy and civil liberties implications from this Australia bill being passed, if it does pass, we might see something similar be introduced in other members of the Five Eyes countries, such as the United States. So that's why something that might seem to be happening on the other side of the planet could potentially have ramifications very soon for us here in the U.S. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Rihanna Pfefferkorn about 
something going on in Australia that actually impacts all of us in a, in a fairly direct way, as you just described it. So how are you approaching this? What What is, I, may, I don't know how far you are into your thinking and your deliberation about what to write, what to argue, but are you taking a side and, and what are your primary justifications and how do you not seem like you're at, at an extreme of either law enforcement, law and order, or an extreme of uh, all information must be sacred and private? So the government of Australia released a draft draft text of the bill last month and requested comments from the public, solicited submissions from the public by uh, the 10th of September, so earlier this week. So I submitted a comment to the government that focused on the language of the bill versus the reality of what it would actually do because there's such widespread concern among members of the public about the potential to have a systemic, uh, what's called a backdoor in Mm -hmm. encryption that would allow access to governments. Um, There seemed to be this balancing act where the government was trying to say, we would mandate that you know, companies be able to give us access in supposedly one-off particular instances, but we wouldn't mandate you to build in a systemic backdoor. But what the government either doesn't seem to understand or perhaps just doesn't want the public to know is that in actual practice, as I mentioned, because there would be such, like, again, again, you wouldn't just have just this one phone, just this one time, um, because there'd be repeated demands, not only from the Australian government, but from all other governments that would want the same treatment. Any solution that Apple or an Android manufacturer, you know, phone manufacturer, et cetera, would have to build would effectively need to be systemic because there'd be so many repeated you know, quote unquote, particular instances that adds up to a system of demands that they would have to comply with. They're not about to just build something um, and then just throw it out and then rebuild it from scratch the next time. At scale, that doesn't work. So in effect, saying that there is no mandate for backdoors is going to result, if this bill passes, in providers having to build uh, something that is, in fact, systemic, and that would be functionally equivalent in a lot of ways to a backdoor due to the risks that I mentioned um, of misuse by authoritarian governments and of the attractiveness of that code as a target for hackers for organized crime. So in your comments, did you get, did you go anywhere towards uh, recognizing legitimate requests and having arguments for what might legitimately be possible. I'm sure I'm sure that you want to balance it to some degree. I mean, is there anything you can say to them about how they could achieve uh, beneficial goals without kind of letting the entire cow herd out of the barn? Sure. So it wasn't something that I addressed in those comments, but I have addressed in a lot of my other work and that I think a lot of the other commentators who did submit, uh, there were a number of organizations and technology companies and human rights activists yes. and uh, professors and academics who submitted comments on this. One thing that they have uh, identified is that, you know, at least in the United States, we really haven't seen a lot of hard numbers to back up the claims that encryption is having the dire impact on law enforcement's ability to do its job that they claim. There is you know, an, an, another narrative that says that we live in what's called a golden age of surveillance, where there are so many different sources of information from our email providers, from social media, um, increasingly from the Internet of Things, as we have Internet-connected devices in our houses, be it a light bulb or a toothbrush, that are going to open up new avenues of information that law enforcement will be able to get access to, um, that If law enforcement can resolve the ultimate goal, like I said, of putting a bad guy behind bars, of prosecuting and investigating their cases, um, without needing to undermine Mm -hmm. encryption's protections for everybody and weaken security for everybody, then there really isn't necessarily the need for having bills like the bill that's been proposed in Australia. And the fact that it cuts into the efficiency of law enforcement investigations is a trade-off to be taken into consideration because, you know, the harder that we make it... Uh, for law enforcement to be able to do their jobs. Of course, that involves further tax dollars at work. Um, But given the security ramifications of weakening encryption, of mandating Mm -hmm. a systemic vulnerability uh, that would inevitably not only be used by just the quote-unquote good guys, but also could fall into the hands of the bad guys, as we've seen in previous instances um, with regard to wiretap ability for the phone networks that we have and that other countries mandate as well. Um, Really, those trade-offs from my perspective and where people fall on this spectrum is different, uh, is not worth passing these new laws Mm -hmm. when, in fact, there are still a number of ways that law enforcement has for being able to solve crimes. 
This is The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Rihanna Pfefferkorn about really how to make this trade-off. And, uh, and, and, and you mentioned the, evi- the trade-off about uh, government, the ease with which government should be able to access information. And the argument you just made is that we should, they should be able to do their job, but we don't have to make it uh, 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 too easy for them exactly. because there's a certain value to there being barriers to information. And th- traditionally, they've worked hard, um, law enforcement, mm-hmm. to get the facts, to get the to get the uh, to penetrate the networks that they need to penetrate. And that uh, that that you're saying there is not a lot of evidence that th- that this is confounding their ability to do that in a, in a significant way. So let me ask you about that evidence because I think that gets right to the heart of this issue. Um, I would think if I was a bad guy <laughs> that I would use entirely and solely encrypted communications with my mm-hmm. fellow bad guys. Is that not the case? Sometimes. Or, or, <laughs> or is it much more complicated than that and that's not really how I should think about it? You know, I think that we see a range of techniques by criminals that may depend on a range of how sophisticated yes. the actors are. Um the thing about sophisticated criminals, which are typically, you know, we, we see the citations to the worst of the worst, you know, child pornography, trade rings, terrorist cells, etc. Those are going to be people who will inevitably be able to continue using uh, strong encrypted you know, communications methods because the math is out there. The software is out there. Even if laws get passed, that knowledge is still going to be there and people will still be able to build on it. You know, we've seen uh, terror cells yeah. and, and you know, jihadis building their own applications. Right. So when you, when they find out that the iPhone is not no longer secure, they'll just um, get their programmers because they're a big enough network that they can actually afford right. to have programmers to build them special apps within their phones or whatever to make sure it is encrypted. Right. And they might screw it up because doing encryption correctly is really, really difficult. But uh, the best means that we have, uh, the best protocols we have for encrypting uh, communications end to end, that will still be out there, notwithstanding any law that gets passed. Right. So another great you know, another resource for law enforcement is just to rely on people making mistakes. And that could look like uh, your average garden variety criminals not using encrypted communications or somehow misconfiguring yeah. applications they use or building ones from scratch that just aren't very it, it good. It makes me smile because you can imagine the terror network sending out patches. Dear fellow terrorists, <laughs> please update your phone because we found a security flaw which might let the governments uh, crack into our operation. And in fact, if they don't have an elaborate system for that, that would be a vulnerability because we know that Microsoft, Apple, Google, everybody is sending out these patches on a regular basis. Right. That's right. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. More with Rihanna Pfefferkorn about the internet, government rights, and citizen rights next on Sirius XM Insight 121. From the campus of Stanford University, this is the future of everything. I'm an informatics and data science guy. With Russ Altman. Welcome back to the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman. I'm speaking with Rihanna Pfefferkorn about cryptography, the government, getting in and out of your data. So we've been talking about breaking into your phone or getting into your phone to get information because you might be a bad guy. You might be part of a terrorist network. But, but Rihanna, you've also been working on the idea of the government hacking into things kind of in a prospective, proactive way. Um, what are the scenarios where the government wants to or should be hacking into, th- into people's devices or the Internet? And um, what's your take on that? So when it comes to government hacking, we can think of that as being another tool in the toolbox that the government would like to have for doing law enforcement investigations in order to access data that might otherwise be beyond its reach. It's sometimes thought of as being an alternative to backdoors and encryption. That's not quite correct in that uh, it's just another tool. They are complementary, that they are not necessarily mutually exclusive alternatives. Mm -hmm. And when we think about mandated backdoors and encryption uh, schemes, that is basically mandating that the developer create an intentional flaw that right. the government would be able to use. When it comes to government So hacking, it's three parties. It's it's the person with the phone, mm-hmm. it's the vendor, and it's the government. Yeah, the holy trinity, exactly. Um, and when it comes to government hacking, we're talking about existing vulnerabilities that already exist in software and hardware because building software and building secure software is really difficult and we're really bad at it so far. You know, not, not to impugn the wonderful computer science department that we have here, but as anybody that you speak to there will tell you, 
doing computer security is really hard. Inevitably, there are going to be bugs and flaws in even the software that's built by world-class teams like they have at Apple and elsewhere. So when it comes to government hacking, that's referring to the government figuring out that these flaws exist and figuring out ways to make use of those to be able to access uh, people's information, whether that means getting into somebody's phone or somebody's laptop remotely, Mm -hmm. whether that means uh, taking a browser such as the Tor browser that obscures your true IP address and using a flaw in that in order to unmask your true IP address and thereby be able to track you down and find you. Right, so it gets rid of that, in in the trinity, so to speak, Mm -hmm. it gets rid of the vendor because the government is going directly after. Is that how essentially in the San Bernardino uh, iPhone controversy? Is that essentially what it turned into? Did the government essentially hack into the phone? There was a third party Ah. vendor whose identity we don't know. There's some speculation that might have been an Israeli company called Celebrate that makes a number of digital forensics tools for law enforcement, but we don't know for sure. Um, And that's exactly right. There was a means of exploiting some flaw that was not subsequently disclosed to Apple because the FBI said, well, we bought the, we bought the, you know, the ability to use this, but we don't actually know how it works. We didn't buy the information Ah. about how it works, so we can't disclose it. And a big part of the the discussion around government hacking is around what sort of process should be in place and under what conditions uh, governments should disclose vulnerabilities to the developers of software and hardware to enable them to fix those flaws. Because huh. if the government can find one, maybe somebody else can find one, and maybe that somebody else isn't somebody that we're as comfortable with knowing about it. So that's one of the things that comes up in a, a white paper that I just published last week, actually, about the security risks of government hacking. Again, to go back to the encryption and backdoors debate, we have a very good understanding of what the security risks are of mandating backdoors in encryption schemes. But so far, we don't necessarily have as well-developed an understanding of what the security risks look like for when the government hacks into devices. So let me just pause for a moment because I just want to make sure I understand. So are there banks of programmers who work for the government who are kind of actively trying to hack into systems? I mean, that's kind of a basic question that I don't know the answer to. There are, and you know, there are going to be people who do that both at the national security agency level, where yes, they have I've heard of them. Yeah, they have these twin offensive and defensive missions there, where they're both trying to secure information systems and find ways to get into you know information systems and tap undersea cables or whatever it right. is that they do. Right. Um, and at the law enforcement level, where the FBI has requested quite a lot of money to continue to develop its tools and its capabilities in this regard to track those down or to buy them from third party vendors. To buy That's what I exploits. wanted to ask you. Is yeah. uh, this might be getting a little bit into the weeds, but in general, are these um, hackers, the, the people who are actually trying to break into systems, are they going to be government employees, or are they in general going to be third-party contractors who the government pays to work on the government's behalf, or is that distinction to you not important? So I think there there are both. So there's both governments and government contractors who work on this, and that's their job. And then there are third-party companies that sell to governments. That that sell to governments such as ours, that sell to less scrupulous governments about human rights abuses, such as uh, you know some in the Middle East, um, and that have come under fire for that. And there's some controversy around what role the government's participation in these markets for vulnerabilities right. plays. You know, is it a, a bad incentive if the government of the United States is going and buying vulnerabilities and exploits for hacking purposes from a company that it doesn't really necessarily have a lot of insight into how else it does business and who else it sells to. This is the future of everything. I'm Russ Altman speaking with Rihanna Pfefferkorn about uh, the government uh, government's uh, activities in the area of hacking into systems for, the, for multiple purposes. So uh, I, this is a really fascinating topic and my head is exploding with questions. Um, let me ask f- um, for um, the government hacking situation. Uh, what is your take in this white paper that you just came out? What is your take on what should be happening? And, and, and particularly, I wanted to ask, it must be very difficult to get information about government activities in this area. This doesn't seem like the kind of thing that would be on the website of the NSA or on the website of the FBI, you know, tab, our activities in hacking. So how do you even get the information about what's happening? And then how do you then reason about it to make recommendations from a legal perspective? 
Well, that's a great question because it has been difficult to find out very many details about what the government does in terms of hacking people. And that makes it hard for a civil society to participate in these debates because it's so easy to just say, look, you don't know what you're talking about. It's all classified. And if you you, you don't right. have any insight into that. Um, but one right now, the government's vulnerability disclosure policy is, comes out of the White House. It's called the Vulnerabilities Equities Process. <clears throat> Pardon me. And the only way that we originally found out under the Obama administration what that looked like was from a civil liberties group called the Electronic Frontier Foundation, basically suing to be able to get access to those documents kind under of freedom open of records information. laws. That's exactly right. And that at least helped prompt a uh, change where there was some more transparency and where we've now seen a revised version of the vulnerabilities equities process from the current White House. But there is some talk about whether this should in fact be legislative rather than an executive branch policy mm -hmm. because with a legislative answer to the vulnerabilities equities process issue, we could have mandated oversight, we could have periodic reports to Congress where the agencies that would be part of this process, which comprise some law enforcement and some intelligence agencies as well as a wide branch, I think Department of Commerce is in there too, for example. There you, go. you know, everybody has an interest in getting access to data, financial agencies, in, in addition to law enforcement agencies, right? Um, if we had a legislate a piece of legislation that addressed this, it might provide for a, a bit more transparency into what that process would look like, which is something we don't necessarily know a whole lot about how it actually gets used in practice. So, yeah, very fascinating. So, tell me, does any of this lead to a set of behaviors that you personally? Um, make uh, thinking about this all day and looking at your phone and thinking about who might be trying to hack it mm -hmm. and 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 the security of your phone and the security of your internet. Is there anything that you do differently from what other people might do because of your level of awareness? I'd say there are three things that everybody could do to have good data security hygiene. One of those is to use a password manager. A password manager such as LastPass or OnePassword can generate strong, secure passwords that are hard to or near impossible to guess. Even so Apple one. Two, three is not what you recommend. Not, not, not ideal. Another would be to have two-factor authentication on your bank accounts, on your email, anything that's important. Uh, have a, a secondary means of verifying that when somebody's trying to log into that account, yes. that it is in fact you. Yes. And uh, you know, the many people find that annoying, including <laughs> people I love and live with. Uh, but you're saying that that really is a necessary evil right now. Absolutely. And the final one would be to always install automatic updates that get pushed to your phone. You know, those resolve actual security flaws that are out there. After Apple versus FBI, I think people can be suspicious. What if this update might in right, fact be trying right. to hack my phone? Um, but it's really important to keep those updates going and updates so that all of your software and your devices are adequately patched. You know, they always have those notes when you do the updates. And it, wouldn't it be fun if you look at the notes and says, introduces backdoor for government access <laughs> to your data. Go press here for, for your update. Um, well, that's fantastic. Thank you for listening to The Future of Everything. I'm Russ Altman. If you missed any of this episode, listen anytime on demand with the SiriusXM app.